Thanks for having me, everyone. I'm Jess Millman, and this is Wood Splitting. There is a god in this tree. She knows it because of last September when the lady beetles came in plagues. Their blood shells pimpled over this bark and made the oak come alive. It had a face, eyelids, lashes, a fish hook of mouth, always grimacing. She knows this because she's heard that face at night, sucking air through its teeth. She knows this because once, on a clear May, under the cold water sky, you stood her under this god for a Sunday picture. She waited for the shutter at the root. She waited, and as you played with the camera, the buckle of her church shoe caught a fat, divine lip twisting there in a small wink of brass. You might like to think it was smiling at her, an old god smiling at a tiny spore. But your little girl has never seen anything smile like that. To these trees, she knows she is temporary. She is a dandelion sneeze on the air. When you tell her you are going to chop down the oak, your child, who has never much appreciated an indirect religion, blows into the backyard to pray to this god. She wears the new stockings, black chains, her Christian white, and your daughter lays down her relic. One copper pot placed at the oak foot where she kneels. God tree is big. The god tree is big, like the lone leg of a giant something sad has happened to. You'd rather not chop it. It's the largest you've ever tried, but the tree is too close to your house. Its limbs spread like the burst of a child's hand in the sun. The tree needs to be split, and the season is here. October, with its wet acorn smell. It won't be summer for a long, long while. In October, the wood splitting month, the forest molts. It is not a snake molt where a new thing peels itself out of the translucence of old skin. It is more of a winnowing. Skinny winter drags through it, emaciating the deer who eat the poplars as naked as old thigh bones. The sweet grass crackles with fallen apples and dead Queen Anne's. When trees are weary, they lie down like bulls, biblical for a little god. Your daughter is little, but she's big enough to recognize the word sacrifice. She's big enough to imagine the sounds your backbone would make collapsing. She's old enough to know that ropes snap, that safeties fail, that some trees will fall however they like, and what will a man do to stop them? doesn't scare you, you say. Your boots are clean, your gloves are pig's hide, and the hair on your throat is blueberry black. What does scare you? Your daughter is growing old. If you look for her, she's easy to find most days. Eight is too small to get very far. She'll be in the yard under this tree in her frowning yellow peacoat, which you bought her for Easter. She will be squeaking up the driveway by herself on a bike. She will be in the 12 seconds it takes for you to watch her walk from your truck down the sidewalk lined with scrawny dogwoods and into the red brick elementary school that, for some hours, divides her life from yours. The day before you cut down God Tree, your daughter leaves from the back of the house closing the old screen door quietly, mindful that it does not slam. Her black shoes are immaculate down the three concrete steps into the leftover grass. The air is low to the weeds, and the evening sun caramelizes her dark hair, making it look like skillet meat. Your daughter has thought out what to do at the base of this tree. She thought about it in math class. She chewed an eraser to bits, thinking... Teachers have told you she is serious enough to be worrisome. In the back of your house, the serious child sits on her knees 
and ruins her new stockings. You would scold her for this, but she figures by the time you pull them out of the hamper on laundry day to find mud stains on her pantyhose, the thing will be done, and she is not playing. And you're in the den drinking cola with Advil for your pains. And the pot waits. It is face down between her legs. It looks up into the branches like a mirror someone has found and shaken out of the dirt. She bows to the tree, her elbows crusty with topsoil, nose running, feeling the stomping of blood in her head. It is not how they do it in church. But there are no pews here, and somehow your daughter knows what to do. I'm a nice girl, she tells the god. Its reflection tangles in the face of the pot. It does not speak, but Godtree's soul is there like she knew it would be. There's an eye opening sleepily, an opaque cataract eye where a wood thrush roosts. Waking a god is a dangerous thing. I don't want to do this, but I need a father, she says. I need a father, says your daughter, but you're going to kill him. What can I do? The God Tree tells her about the law of exchange. The fish tank in your daughter's room is tall and precarious. You bought her this so she could manage something on her own. When she slides the tank off her drawers, teetering, just enough water ladled stealthily into the bathtub so that she'll make it outside, the leftover space looks odd, like something has been cut out. The screen door bangs this time. She holds the tank against her chest and, sloshing, takes it one stare at a time. When you were a child, you lived in a southern, sulfuric state where you did not split wood. Your father's labor was fish. He drove a tiny barnacle boat in a bay surrounded by lemon trees. He poured grass shrimp and red snapper into milk pails. You cleaned them. It made you sick. The skin slipped from your fillet knife and crumpled like wet cheesecloth on the jetty planks. Your daughter does not have memory of that stink. She enjoys the fish, the snaps of color under her lamplight, a quarry cat and a tiger barb. She enjoys measuring pellets into a teaspoon and watching them swarm, but it is not a contest to her. She does not hesitate or overthink it or bother to cry. Your daughter enjoys these fish, but you are her father and she loves you more. She places the tank beside her in the dry grass. She finds a good rock. The pot, if you are not too old to imagine this, looks like a kind of altar, a space to lay a small life face down. Your daughter does not cry. They are just fish and you are people. She does not say goodbye to them, but her sober eyes take a moment to look at each before it happens, held in her grim fingers, before she flattens them out on the pot face and takes the stone. She holds one by one up by the tail fin. They twitch between her thumb and pointer like one muscle, one long, heavy spasm in the air, like the faithful on the end of a rope. She loves you more. To split wood, you require some strength and some eyesight. You fall upon an uncut thing with the full weight of yourself. It's a jumping jack of faith. What you need mostly to be a good wood splitter is a bit of zealotry. You need the sureness to take a breath, bow, let out, and let happen sometimes. Before you, a long time ago, they would chop trees like this at their ankles, counting blows in the thousands with the head of an axe. You use a chainsaw. It makes your eardrums hurt and runs on gasoline. You use ropes, straightening the tree away from your house so you know it will fall deliberately. It will fall perpendicular to the white steps like the arm of a cross. You did not hear the dry, then wet, hands overhead, responsible whack of the stone. Your daughter was born old. She's an old enough god to crouch on the kitchen floor, press the bloodied rock into her chest and wait, listening with every second its own generation for the split 
and wait for the season to end. Thanks for listening.